Hi, Mr. Ben. How are you doing? Oh, pretty good, Ms. Wad. Looks like there's some learning targets on that screen. We've got a few of them here, so we're going to cover clastic sedimentary rocks, or detrital. Okay. And i got to apologize to you guys really fast, and I don't know about the other geology teachers, so do you kind of use the words clastic and detrital interchangeably? Yeah, clastic, broken, detrital, um, broken pieces. I think the book kind of mixes things up too, doesn't yeah. it? So when you hear clastic and you hear detrital, we're probably talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a look at what we've got here on these slides. So, wow, lots of sedimentary rock. Yeah, but wait a minute. I thought, like, the earth has a lot of igneous rock on it does, but we're talking about just the surface of the Earth, and we're remembering that there's 75% of the Earth's surface covered with water. Oh, and the rocks, like the igneous ones that weather, they turn into sedimentary rocks right here. They do that. So that must be why there's so many sedimentary rocks on the surface of the Earth. And all that basalt on the ocean floor? Covered? covered in layers of sedimentary rock. So 90% wow. of the ocean floor covered with sedimentary rock. 75% of the continents. So let's take a look at a few of those types of sedimentary rocks here and what their characteristics are. Yeah, this is probably pretty important. All right. So first of all, the term sedimentary rock or detrital sedimentary rock, what does that exactly mean? Um, let's see, we were talking about detrital, um, you know, we're talking uh, the sediment, things to settle mm -hmm. from that Latin word. Um, you know, you have a weather product that gets left behind. So classic, broken, um, detrital, to settle. So you're talking about pieces of broken things that settle and make a rock. So we started out talking earlier in the year with minerals. We built those together into igneous rocks. Mm -hmm. We broke them down through chemical and mechanical weathering. Right. And now we're building them back up into sedimentary rocks. Right. So we've got four steps to the formation of a sedimentary rock. Right. We've got the weathering mm -hmm. and then transportation of that weathered material. Mm -hmm and then the deposition of the sediment, mm -hmm. and then they have to be lithified into a solid rock. All right, and sometimes it's even five, because they, they lift them up first, right? Could like be. In the mountains? Could be. Okay, but the big ones are the big four. Yeah, okay. so All let's right. take a look at a little graphic here that kind of shows us those steps. So these are the big four. These are the big four. Okay, so you, um, you could have um, uplift lifting things up, and then once they're up there, you have weathering, you said, the clouds, and you're breaking things down. And erosion, that's like transporting them then down to their new environment. Mm -hmm. And those little class, so the little clastic material, they eventually settle and it kind of in layers like in the last group they were talking. So these are probably layered rocks, right? Probably layered rocks. Okay. It's good to see bedding and strata. Okay. And then so they're buried and then either by compaction or like in the lab with the different cements, they could be stuck together. Exactly. So let's take a look at a couple of those. All right. As we start to talk about detrital sedimentary rocks, we're going to talk a lot about the grain sizes. So okay. we want to be really clear on what the grain sizes are. And on this slide we can see that we have gravel, mm -hmm. we have sand, mm -hmm. we have silt, mm -hmm. and we have clay. And remember that order, biggest to smallest, gravel, sand, silt, clay, or smallest to biggest, clay, silt, sand, gravel. Okay. But we want to talk here a little bit about the source of those sediments. So if we think back to continental areas okay. and the continental cratons or shields. We've mm -hmm. got all this granite, right, which has quartz in it, mm -hmm. which has a lot of feldspar mm -hmm. and a lot of ferromagnesium minerals, right. or a few anyway. So we start out with that quartz and what happens to the quartz in the granite? Um, well, we, with the chemical weathering, the mechanical weathering, like the, the feldspar is breaking down like into some clays. Those mm -hmm. quartz grains are really tough, so they probably keep tumbling and tumbling, and they make it maybe all the way down the river, all the way to an ocean. Okay. So you got, you know, some big grains maybe depositing in the river along the way, and you have some little stuff like those feldspars breaking down chemically into clays that probably don't get deposited until they get way out maybe to an ocean or okay. to a lake where it's really calm or maybe even to the swamp they were talking. And up higher where we've got the initial breakdown, the mechanical weathering of that granite, we're going to find larger pieces so we would find gravel. Oh, like so the talus slopes you're talking about, the big rocks. Closer to the source we're going to mm -hmm. have gravel. Mm -hmm. Away from the source you're going to find some of those sand grains which are going to be quartz. Mm -hmm. And then even further away from the source you're going to find the silts and the clays. Okay, so like the deltas, they said they were sands, and then as you go out from the delta, you get the silts and then the clays. Right. I think I got it. Okay, so we got ideas for sources, and each of those grain sizes, let's look at how they're put together into rocks. Excellent idea. Good. All right, so we did this in lab a little bit, but mm -hmm. now we've got a picture of an actual microscope image from a piece of sandstone showing us where the sand grains are and showing us where the cementing agent is. Okay. And also, there's something in there that we haven't talked about, and those are the pore spaces. Okay. So I think you can see in this picture, they're pretty well labeled. You've got the grains, the rounder 
pieces of sand. Mm -hmm. Over on the right side, that really dark material is pores, so that's empty space, right? Right, so the water can go through, mm -hmm. and the water is going to pick up some of those um, ions in it, and the positive ions might, when they're kind of going through the pore, some of them get stuck, mm -hmm. and then they get kind of little pieces of it get jammed in there, like the cement, like what we were doing in the lab. Right. So as the water evaporates out, maybe crystallization occurs, and in between those grains, those little... Um, it's like little minerals forming all over again. Yeah. And those are actually going to hold or cement those sand grains together. Wow. And also it's common to find some clays deposited in among those grains. Because so they're so can small. see that in this picture, yeah. So take a look down here in the bottom right corner and let's see if you can identify the sand grains themselves, maybe label a couple of those. Mm -hmm. And then do you see pore space? Do you see other minerals that are cementing them together? Now let's talk for a second about what the most common cementing agents are. We dealt with a couple of them in lab, mm -hmm. but those were a little bit for our purposes of lab, but what are the most common cementing agents? Okay, well you've got the iron that we did in the lab, the mm -hmm. iron oxides, yep. and then you know out in the ocean you've got, and you've got lots of rocks that are on the land that were once in the ocean, so you've got your calcite, mm -hmm. so your calcite is going to glue things together, okay. and then you have a ton of silica from all your igneous rocks and all the silicates, and so the the silica probably can dissolve and make it or um, bond things together as well. Okay, so three main types of cement. Iron silica, oxide. Iron oxide and calcite. Right. Great. Okay, let's move forward. Ooh, big pieces in this one, and they look kind of dirty, and they look big and small and mixed up. Nothing the same size is not well sorted. Right. Hmm. So we're going to look at a series of rocks here in the next few slides, and we're going to try to figure out what kind of environment they came from, mm -hmm. using our environments from the last uh, video. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to try to figure out what kind of rock this would actually form if it was a rock. So we have two different ones here, both poorly sorted, right? Meaning right. there are lots of different grain sizes. I see gravel, and then I see much smaller grains in, in between the gravel. Mm -hmm. So let's start on the one on the top left. What do you think about an environment for that particular sediment. Well, your top one's really rounded pieces, so mm -hmm. my guess would be they've tumbled a while, a while in a river. Right. But um, it looks like the river maybe came to an abrupt change in energy, like it slowed down real quick and it maybe dumped everything kind yeah. of at the same time. Right. So I would say a river that's come out of the mountains and flowed for a while and then had a big change in speed. Right. Sounds good. And so that rock that we would see in that case, if it was liquefied into rock, would be called a conglomerate, mm -hmm. right? So when you look at a conglomerate, you're going to see rounded grains telling you that there was a lot of transportation, a lot of chances for those grains to get nice and smooth surfaces. Mm -hmm. The one down here is really different, though. Yeah, those aren't rounded. No, we've got lots of very angular particles here, mm -hmm. still surrounded by the smaller particles. So right. I would say that this material has not been transported as far or as long from the source. That makes sense, like right off the mountain. Yeah, so this is going to be closer to its original source. Mm -hmm. And this rock is called a? Breccia. Breccia, yeah, good. So conglomerate rounded particles, breccia, B-R-E-C-C-I-A, with the angular particles. Let's move on and see some of the other rocks. Moving to a smaller grain size, right? We started with gravel mm -hmm. and other sizes. Now we're going down to... And that one looks like it's sand, sand size. size. Looks okay. like we've got, oh, those are like the ones we did in lab, the yeah. ones we compared them to. Sure. So the top one up there, that looks like, um, is it the really clean one? Yeah. Looks like it's all like a really, that one I think didn't react with the acid. Is that, yeah, mm -hmm. didn't react with the acid, very clean, a lot of silica in it I think they were looking at. So that's a sandstone made out of a lot of silica. Um, and sand, so that would be like your quartz sandstone? I think so, and probably some sort of a desert or sand dune kind of environment for this one. Okay. So if we take all those sand grains and we stick them together, you're going to have a lot of silica cement there, mm -hmm. we're going to end up with a really pure quartz sandstone. That makes sense. Yeah, and we're going to talk about uses for that quartz sandstone a little bit later on. And if you ever go out to uh, Starved Rock, mm -hmm. you're going to see a lot of that St. Pete sandstone out there, and it's, it's quarried pretty heavily out there to make glass. Right. How about the one in the bottom corner? Uh, the bottom right one, that yeah. looks um, like it's a little kind of a reddish or a rosy kind of color, mm -hmm. maybe from a feldspar, um, maybe like that delta-ish kind of deposit that uh, Mr. Baldwin was talking about earlier. So the feldspar, um, you know, rich material in it. 
And Is if you're going to have a lot of feldspar, there's potassium feldspar in this, that's where you get the red color. Mm -hmm. You're going to still be pretty cl close to that granite source material. Mm -hmm. And then the one that's kind of in between that gray, really muddy Gray and wacky line, looking rock? Yeah, gray and wacky looking rock. Oh, we didn't name the one in the bottom right corner. Oh, Arco. One in the bottom right corner, Arcos, A-R-K-O-S-E. Mm -hmm. Now we got to go to gray wacky. Yeah, I always think Arcos, the rose, is kind of rosy color. And we got gray wacky, that gray wacky rock. It's kind of like that big and little stuff in it, yeah. uh, kind of dirty sandstone, maybe like from a river, like the other one I was talking about where things kind of drop kind of quick. So what is it in that gray wacky that makes it look gray colored? Um, well, we've got sand, we got maybe the silt? The silt and the clay. The silt right? and the clay. Yeah, the silt and the clay. So the gray wacky is the sand grains, which could still be quartz sand, mm -hmm. and they're held together a lot of times with a lot of clay and muds. So. Wow. So you can have sandstone that isn't just made out of sand, but it can be made out of some other size particles too, but probably a lot of them are sand size. Well, we're using the word sand here as a grain size, right? Oh, so it's okay. in between gravel and silt. Okay. So it's that grain size that we're talking about, sand grain size. Oh, and so the silt and the clay is kind of go in between the sand mm -hmm. grains and join them together. Yep. There you Excellent. Go. Let's go on. Okay, so in this picture, we've got two really different color materials. Mm -hmm. um, the top one is a material that's probably coming from a lake deposit, maybe okay. at the end of a lake where it's flowing out of a lake. All right. And this might be a fairly gritty material, like a silt material. Mm -hmm. And if we had a rock that was formed from that material, it would end up being a siltstone. Okay. And in lab, we're going to talk about how you identify siltstone by its gritty feeling, yeah, it's and rough like, feeling, mm -hmm. like a fine sandpaper almost. So it could be um, this one, if you probably can't even see the layers. You could probably barely see, see the little pieces of silt, mm -hmm. like the last smallest thing you can see with your eye. Right. So it might feel a little bit like sandstone, but almost too like slippery. Got it. So a lot like sandstone. And the bottom one that looks like maybe you know it's really like the kind of a dirty. Would that make kind of a blocky version of the same thing? Yeah, but this is going to be an even finer material, and you can tell by the difference in the color. So you've mm -hmm. got that muddy gray look mm -hmm. that you've got clays in this water. Okay. So this is a little stream environment, mm -hmm. and you're going to find materials here that are going to be things like clay stones. Okay. Okay, so let's move on. All right, when we talk about clay stones and clay-sized grains, we end up with two different kinds of rocks. So in the bottom right corner, mm -hmm. we have one of them. And it looks very different from the one in the top left corner. Yeah, the one on the right's that blocky looking mm -hmm. kind of one. So that would be the clay stone, right? right? Okay. So the particles are so small, the clay just kind of makes the little blocks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the one in the top left, that's got a feature that we call fissility. Mm -hmm. F I S S I L I T Y, right? Mm -hmm. It okay. kind of looks like Sorry. the cleavage that we had with minerals, too. Mm -hmm. It does. Mm -hmm. It does. And that is the shale. Okay. So what are we seeing when we see all those layers there? Isn't that like that, that layering, like the slow compression and layering of the clays one on top of the other? Because clays, remember, are going to be very flat and mm -hmm. exhibit that kind of uh, comp structure. So they're going to layer in and show facility. It's a little tiny like bricks making big flat layers. Got it. Excellent. All right, let's go on. Ooh, this one looks pretty... Um, like kind of the ones we were looking at before where it's rounded and then the other one's broken up. Mm -hmm. So that one on the right was like the broken one, the breccia that we had before where right. you said where it kind of came right off the mountain and kind of fell into the river. Uh -huh. And then the other one, the conglomerate, we've mm -hmm. got all nice rounded grains here. So they've tumbled a long way down probably a steep slope, mm -hmm. broken off all those sharp edges. Right. So that helps us understand the environment that these two were part of, that mm -hmm. you're closer to the source, less... Uh, abrasion, less mechanical weathering on the breccia right. than on the conglomerate. Excellent. So that gives us a little hint of the history of the rock. So the, the, the degree of roundness tells you kind of how far away it is from its source. Yep. More rounded, further away. Yep. Here we go. So I think we have uh, one more slide here and um, talking about some practical uses for mm -hmm. these kinds of rocks. So we're going to show you a quick video in a minute, but before we do that, we've got a couple other things. Um, sandstones, conglomerates, and we'll fix that slide a little bit later on, but these kinds of rocks are used to make things like bricks, mm -hmm. they're used to cast metals, they're used to make ceramics and potteries, mm -hmm. but they're also used in glass. Mm -hmm. So should we jump out and show this video? It's that sounds like one. a great idea. That looks like an exciting video. Yep, let's see it. Here we go. Glass. 
It is a gift from nature, fire and sand. For centuries we have embraced this gift, harmonized it with practically every aspect of our lives. Consider the packaging of the foods we eat and the beverages we drink. The versatility of glass endures. We begin with raw materials, silica sand, soda ash, limestone, and cullet. Cullet is recycled glass that helps reduce the amount of raw materials needed to make new glass. Cullet provides important energy savings by lowering the temperature needed for the melting process, helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Each ingredient is measured, then combined into a batch mixture. During this step, additional ingredients may be added to create various colors of glass. The batch travels to the furnace and is heated to a temperature of about 1,565 degrees Celsius or 2,850 degrees Fahrenheit. Here it is melted and becomes molten glass. The molten glass passes through a refiner where trapped air bubbles are allowed to escape. After the molten glass passes through the refiner, it is cooled to a uniform temperature. See how the feeder pushes the liquid glass through the openings? Those shear blades cut at just the right moment to form elongated cylinders called gobs. Now they are ready for forming. The gobs are diverted into the forming machine where, using compressed air, they are made into containers. These So thanks for fixing that slide for me, Mr. Bin, while we were watching the video. So now you can see the rest of the uses for detrital sedimentary rocks. And I was thinking while I was fixing that, that there was one more use for that limestone. You have on here that, you know, that's used for um, cement and ingredients. Don't they make like, um, isn't all that limestone that they have around here, don't they have big quarries where all that limestone, they break it up and that's one of the basis for all the concrete that we have. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about that more in the next video. So thanks for leading us into that next video. A segue there. But I think right now we've got a mastery check for you guys to take. So hop on out to your class webpage and grab that quiz and we'll see you in class tomorrow. Thanks a lot, guys.